I'm curious about something. So they were talking about what is not a structured loop and what is a structured loop. A structured loop, if you were going to flow chart, the line always has, has to go back to the diamond. It can't go somehow above the diamond. You could do that in some low-level programming language like assembler or something, but in a structured programming language like this one that gives you a while or a for keyword, then there's no way to even implement that. It's not like you're supposed to do it like this but you can choose not to. In a good structured language like Python, you just flat out cannot do this. You cannot have an arrow that goes back up above the diamond because that's the while keyword or that's the for keyword. And so the end of the loop, it's just going to jump straight back to the diamond or as they show it going up, you know, above it. But it's the same idea, right? I always draw it pointing directly at the diamond. I think that's a little clearer, but we're allowed to customize the rules a little bit. So common loop applications, using a loop to accumulate totals. Business reports often include totals, for example, the list of real estate sold and the total value. Do we talk about accumulators? This is looking pretty familiar, but you know, I just taught the other class yesterday, so is this a yes or no? All right, I guess I could confirm that by loading up our notes for that day. Yeah, we did. Okay, right. So, did I say what page we stopped in? No. Okay, so here's an example of an accumulator loop in total, where it adds up a total. That's our accumulator. We set it equal to zero. We set our counter either equal to zero or one, depending upon how we want to hook our data up, right? And then we keep going adding one to our total, not adding one to our total. Yeah, in this case, we're adding the count to our total because we want to add one and then two and then three and then four and so on. Now we could rewrite this with a for loop. It'd be a little bit cleaner. I didn't do that down there, so I'm going to do that again. Just demonstrating it right in yesterday's notes. How about that? Okay, so we would have to declare our total. That's our accumulator. But we don't need a counter because the for loop manages it for us. For count in, for count in range, 0, 11, because we want to stop at 10. And then total plus equals count. There. Now we've done this five lines of code and three lines of code. So just a cleaner way of doing it. All right, time to actually start a new file. Am I correct? And this is a Q, I believe. So we could write an application that would let the user add up values, right? Add up a series of test scores or something like that. Let's do that and let's try to make it as realistic as possible. What we're going to do is we're going to ask for the user's name. And if the user's name is equal to quit, we're going to not let them add in any scores. Otherwise, we're going to ask for some scores and we're going to add them all up. So it's going to be a nested loop. So I'm going to initialize a variable name just equal to an empty string. And the reason I'm doing that is so I can make that our loop control variable. So that's our loop control variable. And then we're going to do while name not equal to quit because that's our, hopefully nobody in our class is named quit. But we better ask for the name before we start entering the loop. This is what's known as a priming read. And it's not my favorite way of implementing this stuff, but it's how the book teaches. So let's do this. Name is equal to input parentheses quote student name 
or quit to stop. Space, angle brace just to make it easy to see where they're supposed to type, end quote, in parentheses. All right, now what are we going to do? Are we going to let them enter a series of random scores and then type in negative one to quit, or are we going to say you always have five scores? There were five scores in this class, and we want to add them all up. Let's do the later. So, ask for five test scores. This is a definite loop. We know how many we want. Since this is a definite loop, try to use a for loop. All right, so for test number, how about just tnum? Test num is a better variable name. In range, starting at one and going and stopping before we hit six. So one comma six in parentheses, and this counts from one to five. Now we can print something to the effect of enter test score, or enter test score one, enter test score two, enter test score three, something like that. So print, or heck, let's just use it inside the, no, 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 it's easier this way. Print, parentheses, quote, enter test score, end parentheses, or blah, 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 enter test score, space, end quote, don't even need to space. Enter test score, quote, comma, test num, comma. Yeah, that's enough, huh? And then on the next line, let's get the test score. Score equals, now I've goofed up because I don't have an accumulator. I'm going to have to go and put an accumulator up above some of this stuff, probably above our for loop. Score is equal to input parentheses, quote, angle quote, that's just to tell them where to type. Otherwise, if we didn't care to tell them, we'd just do that. And let's convert it to a float so we can do math. Score equals float score. And let's add it to our accumulator, which, guess what, I forgot to add. So I'm going to come here above our for statement and set initialize a variable equal to zero. That's our total, and I'm going to put a comment that this is our accumulator. I'm going to stop doing that at a certain point. But All right. Then the next thing we need to do is add that. Test, wait, total plus equals score. Now we could print out the student's name, and we could print out the total, and if we cared, we could even print out the average. Let's not calculate the average this time. Keep this as clean as possible. So I'm back tabbing because I don't want this to be part of the loop. Remember it said common mistake is putting stuff inside the body of the loop that's not supposed to be there? We're printing out the student's name and their average, their test score, their total. It's not supposed to be in the loop. So print, parentheses, quote, student name equals, end quote, comma, name. Then let's do it at the test scores. Print, parentheses, name, comma, quote, total equals, end quote, comma, total, like that. And we could even probably get rid of this one, that first one, because we're printing the name in two places. And the last thing we need to do is to get a new name, right, so that we can check, so we can start going. We got the name out here as a priming input, and then we did a bunch of stuff with that name, and then we better get a new name. So the last thing, at bottom of loop, 
get a no name. This is why I don't like priming reads like they show it. I'd rather put the input inside the while loop, and so it's the first thing you see inside the while loop. And then maybe use a break statement to get out. But the book doesn't talk about break statements, so I waffle between showing you the book way and showing you what I consider the better way. All right, so input parentheses, wait, 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 wait. It's going to be this line exactly again. You feel like copying that line and pasting it to make sure you get it right? That's totally cool. And make sure it's tabbed appropriately, just one level in. All right. And then let's print a done message. Right. So we know that they successfully stopped rather than just looking at a blank screen wondering. And then run it. I didn't save my program. Lecture Q. All right, so student name. Bob, Bob Jones. Enter test score, you earned 100 the first time, 200 the second time, 300, 400, 500. And so he earned a whopping 1,500 points on his exam. I wish I earned that on all my exams. Student name or quit to stop, all right. Share, shares in our class. She scores even higher than Bob Jones, 200. 300, 500, 1,000, and 2,000. All right, so Cher's total is that. Now I'm tired of playing this game, so I type quit, bail out. It's working. This is demonstrating two things. It's demonstrating a loop that adds up a total, like the slide on our current uh, PowerPoint shows, but it's also wrapped in, up inside of another loop, an outer loop. Kind of like, uh, do you wish to play again? Yes, no. You choose yes, then you know you get to play again. Choose no, you don't get to play again. You give it a name, but if the name was equal to quit, then it stops executing the loop. I hope you see why this input had to be down here rather than up here. We could make a couple of changes that would make it more happy for me. It'd be a while true loop. I, I, I could figure out a way of doing it even without a break statement, but it's going to require even more nesting. Yeah. Short form, it would look like this. So, how to do this without a priming read. Let's reinitialize our name variable equal to zero. Excuse me. Let's reinitialize this so our name is an empty string. And we're going to while name not equal to quote quit end quote. Let's ask for the name. Name equals input parentheses quote name question mark space greater than, end quote, in parentheses. And then if the name is equal to quit, then that means that they didn't want to do anything else, right? If name equals equals quit, then we're going to do some other stuff. Print. Okay, now we are getting all the scores. Now we're not going to actually write that because that just... Right. I guess we could. Why be lazy? Well, one reason to be lazy is because every single time we run our test program now, we're going to have to enter all this data. But here's what you would do. Is come up here and copy all of those statements. Total for test num all the way down to print name is equal to total. And those of you writing my hand, good luck copying and pasting. I know some people who use a stylus on their iPad to write stuff, and I don't even know how they write fast enough on their iPad to get this done, but it's, their notes look pretty cool at the end. I should ask her to give them to me so I could upload them, but it's for another class. 
So anyways, grab all of that stuff, copy it, come down here and paste it, but we're going to have to tab it over a level because it's going to be nested one more level deep, you see, because we have an if in here. So paste it, but make sure, whoopsie, it's lined up correctly, meaning it all has to be lined up under the if statement. So grab all of that, and I better stop and uh, make sure we're all doing okay. And either choose format and dent, or just hit tab like that. And now I'm going to put a few comments because once the level gets more indented, more than too deep. That's the end diff, and that's the end file. All right. I don't know if you even care if these if these uh, stuff look about the same to you or not, but the difference is is that we're getting the name inside the loop, and then we have an if statement to rule out that they typed our signal value. This is a signal value because it's what stops the looping. And to get that to work, we had to put an if statement inside our while. We had to put the for statement inside the if, so it's nested several levels deep, right? It's nested one, two, and then the body of it, the stuff where we get the numbers and we add them to our total, is nested three levels deep. Whereas before, it was not. Right, it was only left nested two levels deep. So the price of avoiding this priming read and then having to put the input statement down here at the bottom again is extra nesting. The advantage is, is you're only asking for their name in one place. I hate duplicating code. I hate having a name, name is equal to input up there and then another name is equal to input down there. Either way works. You can just pick one run with it. Pardon me? Can you hang it there for a second? Yeah, yeah. Why don't we wander around and make sure that we're all doing okay about it. Okay, there was a change here that we need to make because right now it's only asking for test scores if the name is quit. We'd rather only ask for test scores if the name is not equal to our signal value. So we did definitely have to change this line. Change to not equal. That's the line that we had to just change. All right, once you get this running, it means that for the rest of the lecture, you're going to have to enter all this data. That's going to get tedious, so we'll probably make the rest of our notes above these loops. So I'm going to scroll up above the loops and just start typing up here at the very top for the rest of our lecture. So the accumulator gathers the values. Counters just count by one. It doesn't look like we have a counter here, but we really do. Test num is our counter. With, right? Enter test number one, enter test number two. And it is going up by one each time. We started at one, it goes up to five, it stops when it hits a six. Meanwhile, the accumulator goes up by whatever the user enters or whatever data it reads from disk or something like that. So summary report contains only the totals with no detail, right? We summarized. We said that, you know, Joe Bob total score was 1,500 and Cher's total score was 2,200 or whatever. We didn't list the individual tests. They entered that data, but we didn't display it. So no, the detail information is not printed. Defensive programming is checking for errors before they occur. Meaning that when you prompt an error, a user for data, you make sure that it's valid. So we could use a loop to make sure that the test scores are valid data. Now that fluffs up the logic of this code considerably. Instead of just doing this, we have to put that inside a while loop. I don't really want to fluff this up any more than what we show, what we already have, but we can do it up here. Right, so we can set our score variable equal to an invalid value. And actually, that doesn't matter. We can just do valid is equal to false. Valid is equal to false. And then while 
valid equals equals false or while not valid colon we ask for the score score equals input parentheses what is the score in parentheses not in parentheses question mark space angle in quote in parentheses convert it to a float score equals float score and let's make sure it's valid since we're checking to see if it's in a range we're going to use and if score is greater than equal to zero and scores less than zero uh less than or equal to 100 colon it's a good score so we set valid equals a true else we tell them what they did wrong so i back tab and print score must be between 0 and 100 might have been nice to tell them that at the beginning right and then the end while comment so that's going to loop until they finally give us a valid score right and then valid it will be set to true and it will exit the while loop you see what i mean though if i had to stick these eight lines of code everywhere i ask for the input it'd make this loop a lot harder to understand the real thing to do would be to put this inside a module so that we could call it when we wanted to now we haven't done modules in a while because they talked about it like in chapter one and two and then we skipped it may as well do it now though let's turn this into a module which means that we're gonna have to indent all of this stuff remember the fast way of indenting highlight it all tab it with either the tab key or format indent and there's two more things we need to do we need the header of the module and we need a return statement at the bottom that returns our score so def space get score parentheses in parentheses colon that defines our module and then down here in line with the valid and the while and our end comment do return score so we just added that line and we just added that line and we just added yeah those were the two lines of code we added and we had to indent the other stuff so we can get the scores easy now right we don't have to copy and paste these 10 lines of code everywhere we want getting a score is as easy as this x equals get score y equals get score it'd be real easy to change our our code down there our loop instead of calling input to just call get score i think i'm going to leave it alone but if you want to experiment do that come down here and make an in change this score is equal to input to score equals get score parentheses in score just see if it works if you feel like it. All right, what's the score? 200. Nope, sorry. What's the score? Negative one. Nope. All right. 100 didn't work. I've got a logic error. Does 99 work? <laughs> it's not letting me out no matter what I type. 50. It accepted 50. It didn't like 99. Or not. Maybe I'm just confused by what's going on. As far as I can see, it rejected it every single time. I think it's printing this message out every single time. Go look at our logic. Oh, yeah. Check this out. What's wrong with this code? Specifically, what's wrong with that line? It needs the, the else. Yeah, it needs an else in front of it because the only time we want to print it is if the score is not valid. So I'm going to have to change this line right here. 
I need an else in front of it. So enter back tab else colon and then tab that over. So I had to fix those two lines. And now it'll be the way that I want it to work. So this is an example of a data validation loop. I'm going to add some comments here to make that very clear. Below is example of a data validation loop. It is enclosed. It is placed in a module so it can be called repeatedly. Maybe the name of it should have been called input score since we would be replacing the input statements. Maybe we should have made it accept a message parameter because down here when we're asking for input we put something there that we were displaying but not much. I want to go ahead and fix the first one. Nah, nah, nah. I really want to leave this stuff alone. I want to leave our two loops alone so that they're as clean as possible. What's the score? 101? Nope, sorry. Negative 1? Nope, sorry. 5? Yeah, that liked it. It went on to the next one. Negative 20? Nope, sorry. 0? Okay. And then it's gone on to the next stuff. Garbage in, garbage out. Unvalidated input will result in erroneous output. Right? If we accidentally let somebody enter a negative value or a 200 for a test score, then um, you know the rest of it's not going to work. So limiting a reprompting loop. Reprompting can be annoying if it goes indefinitely. What we might want to do is give them five mistakes, and then if they make all five mistakes, then we just assume a zero or something like that. Now, for test score, that's kind of dumb, right? If you make five mistakes, we're going to give that user a zero. Well, that's our fault, and they shouldn't get a zero. But you could do that, right? If there's a problem with the data and they get stuck at the prompt, then eventually the program goes on. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Right, enter a valid zip code, and if they don't enter a valid zip code after five times, you're going to default it. What? Then it's going to go to the wrong, you know, wrong address. So validating you can do in several different ways. You can use is numeric to make sure that the input is numeric to begin with. Why would you do that? So that it doesn't crash if you type in non-numeric data, like this. Let me get rid of lecture P. Right when I run it here, if I type in dollar sign 100, right, it blows up. Yeah, and you know, yeah, you, you accidentally hit the wrong keys when you're typing in numbers. Well, we can make sure. Before we even do the score is equal to float. We ought to check to make sure that it's valid data, that it's numeric. Now, this would take some rejiggering and retabbing and stuff like that, so I'm slightly reluctant to do it. But let's make this as good as possible. And you could even copy and paste this code into your own projects anywhere you need it in or a number. Except you change the writing, right? You wouldn't say, what is the score? Anyways, if... Score dot is it is digit is digit parentheses in parentheses colon and we haven't I don't really even think we've talked about is digit yet. Nope. Then take everything else underneath that down to the end while highlight score 
the if, the valid, and the else, and the print. Highlight all that and tab it over because it all has to be inside the if. And we're going to need one final else, but it's going to have to be back tab several places. I think I'll just put my cursor here at the end while to make it easier to get to, get to the right tab level. So end while, go up a level, hit tab twice, and we're going to do else colon. And on the next line, print input must be a number. Print parentheses, input must be a number. Or even a whole number. Because is digit will fail if it's not a whole number. That's one of its flaws in my mind is it does not allow 1.23. It only allows, you know, whole numbers. So what did we do? We added this. We tabbed all of this stuff over. And then we added these two lines. And let's see if it works. But try typing in some stuff that's not going to work, like um, letters, you know. What is the score? H100. Oops. Input must be a whole number. What is the score? 99.5. Sorry, input must be a whole number. Okay, now see, I would like test scores to support fractions. What is the score? Okay, it accepted that one. And then what is the score? You know, the next one is 80. Okay. So this is not a bad input function, but it only gets whole numbers. So we ought to change its name to something like input underscore int, I-N-T, to represent that. That's all it supports. And it also only supports 1 and 100. So it's kind of a specialized input, but it demonstrates the idea of data validation. Let's add some comments describing what it enforces. It enforces the input to be between 0 and 100. And it enforces the input to be a whole number. There's a simpler way of implementing that, but it's using uh, something that we really haven't learned called a try except block. Maybe I've demonstrated that once or twice. Maybe I haven't. All right. Good time to stop again. So, they mention is numeric, but that's not the Python way. It's called is digit in Python. Is care, in ours it's called is alpha. Is white space, in our language it's called is space. And is upper, well that's correct. So let's go ahead and list those. We'll see them again later. String functions to validate data include s dot is digit parentheses in parentheses s dot is alpha parentheses in parentheses and s just means the string data if your variable is called score it would be score is digit or score is alpha s dot is upper is it uppercase is it all uppercase s dot is lower s dot is alnum a l n u m which means letter or digit And s dot is white, which means, no, not not is white, is space. They put that in my brain, that page did. Means is white space. White space can be a tab, it can be the space bar, it can be the return key, a slash in. And that should have been an s dot. All right. And you can use all of those functions to validate your data in some way. And there's other ways, too. You can make sure it exists in a list of values that you define. 
If they can only use letters A through E, you might validate that it is a letter A through E. Tell them to type it in again. So loops are certainly good for data validation. I keep loading that up when I mean that one. So we're trying to validate the reasonableness and consistency of the data. <coughs> Good defensive programs try to foresee possible inconsistencies and errors. A defensive program is one that gets upset when it thinks you insulted it. No way. A defensive program is one that will not crash and will not produce bad input, will not allow the user to enter bad input. Many data items can be checked for reasonableness. If you ask for a zip code, you might make sure it's five characters long, five digits long. But what if they like to use their nine digit zip code? In which case, you'd have to write some more complicated code to check that the first five digits, the first five characters are digits, and then maybe there's a dash, a hyphen, and then there's, you know, four more spaces, four more digits. Like my zip code is 73737-1234, right, whatever. That just gets it almost, make zeros in your zip code almost directly to your house. Even if you wrote the city wrong on your, uh, on your, on your mail, then it would get there because of the extended zip code. And so we haven't drawn a flow chart for our loops here, but they look something like this because we nested so many different levels, it would be worth drawing a flow chart. Depending on how much time we have left, that may be what we do. We have time. All right, I think I do want to do at least this one as a flow chart. So we're going to go to Lucid, Lucid chart if you're going to draw along. lucidchart.com Now what we are graphing in this case is a module. So instead of a start, a start oval, it's going to have the name of the module. So my top oval is not going to have the word start in it, it's going to have the name of the module. I could even put the word DEF there if I felt like it. And we called it get score parentheses and parentheses. And I don't have my code memorized, so I'm going to have to keep flipping back and forth to look. The first thing we do is we have a set. Set valid equals false. And then we have a while not valid. So, set valid equals false. Then we had a while, so a diamond. While valid equals false, or while not valid, that's a more professional way of doing it. Then we're going to come over here and we're going to get our input. Inputs go in, tilted. So input score. If you hold the Alt key and the Shift key at the same time, then when you resize it, it keeps it centered the way it was. See what I mean? Otherwise, it winds up doing that. Now that we have the score, we can check to see if it's if it's numeric. That's an that's an if statement. If score dot is digit. Wrong shape. It's a diamond. If score is digit is numeric.
Maybe we handle the else clause first, because the else clause was shorter. If I come over here and I look, the else clause only had one stuff, one line. Nah, let's do the if stuff first, the, the, the good stuff first. So if it is numeric, we need to convert it to a float. So convert score to float. Then what was the next line in our code? If score greater than zero and score less than 100, then valid is equal to true. That's yet another if statement. If score greater than equal to zero and score less than one equal to 100, That looks kind of lame. I'm going to use the control enter key or command enter on a Mac to try to put the if up there. That makes it look a little bit better. I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to fix that. We could just make the if block larger, right? Well, that messed up. All right. And if the score is good, then what did we do? Somebody look at your code and tell me what the code that's nested inside the if score greater than zero is. Okay, please repeat because I didn't hear. Yeah, valid is equal to true. But there was an else. If it was not true, then we're in trouble and we need to print an error message. So off the other side, print, or output, doesn't matter which, output score must be between 0 and 100. And again, you can use Control Enter or Command Enter to space it out a little bit better. Now they need to rejoin. So I'm going to need a little oval. Excuse me, not an oval. I'm going to need a circle. Or a big circle, but I'm going to resize it. And I'm going to take out the A, although I don't care if you leave the A. And we need a block going to there. And we need a block going to there. All right, now we've got a little bit of a problem. I guess it's not too big of a problem. Kind of running out of space here. If I zoom out, I think it's going to be OK, though. I think it'll look OK. I may wind up moving this stuff around. And what I mean by that is I might have to move all of that over like that to make room for the other side. And if I was dropping a line straight down from this, if it had no else, if it was a single alternative selection, then I would move it over. But I think it's going to be OK. So this line, the no line, needs to come off from if score is numeric. And I'm not liking the fact that if is not on a line by itself. So I'm going to click on there and hit Control Enter. Still not liking it. All right, whatever. OK, so if the score is numeric, is no, if it's false, else, we need to tell them score must be numeric, must be a whole number. Output, control enter, quote, score must be a whole number, end quote. And I'm going to try to get it to look nice. Now that one has to meet this line, right? So somehow I need to join the, this one and this one together. So I'm going to need another circle down here at the bottom. Maybe shrink it down, maybe take the A out. Draw a line from there to there. 
kind of trying to line it up with this oval, with this diamond. Draw a line from there to there. All righty. Now, lastly, this is the end of the loop, isn't it? Was there any code after that before the end of the while? If I come back and look, it must be, nope, end while is the last thing. So somehow I need a line from here to here. And I sure didn't leave myself much room to draw that line. There's several options. I can do it right. I can draw it like that and then stretch it out that way. You know, there's, there's all sorts of things you could do, but I'm going to undo that. What I'm going to try to do is to shift all this stuff over. So very carefully, I'm going to try to grab all that stuff and move it over to the left. And the reason I'm doing that is to give myself space. You can use the space bar to move the page around so that I can draw a line like that. The book would show the line coming back all the way around and going to the top of the diamond. All right, we're practically done, except we need our return statement. If we come back and we look at the code, after the end while is a return. So I could just stretch it all the way down here, return the score. Or if I don't like it being that far, you know, I could grab this and kind of, you know, put it up there. But I would rather move it all the way down there because that's the way the code looks, right? At this point, my code kind of resembles, my flowchart kind of resembles the code at this point. What do I mean by that? If I'm looking at it, there's a while and then inside the while is nested a score and an if and inside that if is a float command and another if statement and else statements that kind of go off to the left kind of mess up the indention level but you can kind of see the similarity right while went over one tab and if went over another tab and this last if went over one more tab and that matches this while tab if tab if tab and then they all joined back up together so that the end while could loop back up to the while like that. And then our return score is at the bottom. All right, now that I've made it zoomed out, it's hard to see everything. So you may not have gotten all the text. It's been forever being picky about these things. You absolutely do not need to do what I'm about to do, but if you think this line would look better as a curved line, you can come up here and choose instead of straight angles, you could choose curves, and then you have to mess with it like you were playing with Adobe Illustrator, try to get it right. It can be a pain, so there's no real need to do that. Unless if then you wanna. Right. I may undo it just because it's too fancy. Kinda neat. And what if we had some code that was supposed to call this module? Start, and then we would need a module call box, which is the ones with the bar, the bars. X equals get score, and then a stop. Right. I'm just doing a really, really short example of how you illustrate a module call, a function call. It can be hard to draw arrows between the shapes when you compact them as close as I did. So sometimes you zoom way in with the command key, the control key to get that to work. All right. 
Was that necessary? Not necessarily. And for those of y'all who already colored your things, you might not want to do this, but when I do this, I colorize the module box with the paint bucket, pick some light color, and then I call it colorize the module call with the same color. Right there. Just makes it blatantly obvious what's being called where. Alrighty, you're not going to much like what I'm going to make you do next, but your homework is going to be to flowchart the other program we wrote, specifically the last chunk here, the second chunk here. So I'm going to put a comment here where it says how to do this without a priming read. I'm going to do homework. chart the following code and it's got a while loop right it's got some if statements and it's got a for loop oh boy how are we gonna flow chart that for loop well just do it like a while loop I'll give you a hint Let, let's go back to our flow chart and I'm just gonna put a diamond there that represents how I would do that right so I'd come over here, stick a diamond, and put for test num in range one comma six. Right. I'd just go ahead and embed pure Java in that. The book's not going to show you doing it that way, but then again, the book doesn't show you putting the word if and while. And then you can, you know, do some blah blah blah. Right. Whoopsie. All right, anyways. So you'd have something above it, whatever that something was. You'd have some stuff off inside the loop, inside the body of the loop. And then you'd have a, like that, right? And then when you're done, you go down here and you do something else. Like that. Just like a while, except I go ahead and embed the actual Python command in here. If I had thought ahead, then I could have written this with a while statement, but I really want y'all to try to use for loops whenever you have a definite loop, whenever you have a counter. So, it was just that flow charting was invented long before for loops existed. So, there's no exact syntax for that. All right, I don't mind ending a, ending a few minutes early. Last thing I would have done if I was going to make this an actual homework assignment would be I would scroll up here and I would grab my code and I would paste it in a box, right? I always appreciate when you do that and when you put your name on it. So I would get a box. I would paste it in there. And then I would write justify it. What does that mean? or left justify it so that it looked good. I'm dragging it off the side of the page. Give myself more room. Right. Just highlight everything. Choose the box and then come up here and choose a little alignment thing. And you already know how to do this. Set it to left justified and it looks a lot better. And you can put your name up there too. And you put it on the Left side instead of the right. Doesn't matter where it goes. It would fit on the right side, you're right, so I could go and put it over there. There, I got it. All down and one page. Not necessary. Since I'm going to be uploading it as a PDF, I'm taking the time to do that. And y'all realize that this is not an entire flowchart. It's just an example of how you flowchart a for loop, according to Professor Thompson's guideline.
example of flowcharting a for loop. And I think I'll put a similar comment over here because this is an example, if, if you even drew those. Example of flowcharting a comment, excuse me, a module call. Now I wish I could just grab this part and stretch it out, but I had trouble trying to, no, no, it worked this time, what do you know? Last class I was having fits trying to get that to work. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and make the Dropbox for those of y'all who drew this quickly, and then um, I'll bring this back up on the screen for those who want extra time drawing it.